Hey everyone, welcome back. This is week 50 of Creative Come Follow Me for the New Testament. And this week we're going to be in our second of our three weeks in the book of Revelation. Now this is a longer one. We cover nine chapters this week. So we're going to go from six all the way through 14. By the end of this week's chapters, we're going to be talking about basically the gathering of the wheat and the tares and that phase that occurs where time is up and things need to change. All of the chapters before 14 talk about how many times he reaches after his children. I got to tell you, one of the things that was hard for me this week in my study was my heart wants to be in the Christmas story. (laughs) Maybe it's because of the first presidency devotional. Like I found myself aching to set down the dragons and the fires and the storms and just focus in on the beautiful miracle of the Christmas story. What's interesting to me, you guys, is over the course of study, as I pushed myself to try to understand the book of Revelation and understand what John was trying to teach me, the more I came to appreciate the Christmas story. Because I really think this is why he came the way he came. In fact, this week, you're going to see things, well, you'll see these vivid contrasts. You're going to see the adversary show up with pomp and fear and storms. And then you're going to see the Savior as the Lamb. And I feel like that's what the Christmas story teaches us as well. In order to save us from all of this destruction that is coming, the Savior comes as this quiet, powerful Lamb. And that's the message of these chapters. It it is a, well, I guess the verse that really kind of came back to me as I was studying the most is what the Savior teaches about when he's looking over his children, especially those who don't choose his path. He has this ache and he says things like, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks? What John is teaching us this week, you guys, is why we need to find refuge under those wings, because there are great storms coming. And the Savior knows about those storms and he offers us this refuge in his gospel. And he invites all to come under his wings. But what I think is really powerful about that metaphor is there's nothing to hold you there. You have to choose every day to stay in that refuge. And if you choose it, you have the protection that he promises. And if you wander out, you're exposed to the storms and to the distractions and the fear that's outside of it. And I think that's what John's trying to help us understand. I think he wants us to see the gift that the Savior offered as he gave himself as a shelter and refuge for us. And He's just urging us to come inside. And I honestly think it's it will strengthen your testimony of the Christmas story as you jump into these chapters. I promise it's worth your time. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. Before you jump into six, it might help you get your bearings at the very end of five. Because remember, last week we left off on sort of a cliffhanger. You know, the Savior had just willingly taken the book out of the God the Father's right hand, and the whole of heaven celebrated, right? They rejoice in song because he's willing to open these seals. He's the only one that's authorized to do it, and he he chooses to do it. In chapter six, you see those seals begin to be opened by the Savior. In fact, that's what it says in verse one. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. So this is John still in that visionary experience, and he's seeing the Savior open up those seals. What I thought was so powerful about this, you guys, is what comes out. (laughs) So what's interesting is over the course of these seals being opened, devastation comes out. You learn later in the chapter that also prophets come out and good comes out. But in these first nine verses or so, it's all bad. (laughs) These horses come out. So the horses have a rider on them. They're all different colored horses and they represent sort of the awfulness of men on the earth. That each of those seals represents a thousand years and during those thousand years and beyond it, devastation sort of unfolds. So at first you're going to see a white horse that represents conquest. This is sort of the natural man taking over and dominating different landscapes. This idea of like conquering viciously other locations that rolls into the second horse that uh, is a red horse. Yeah, This is the one that represents warfare because he's got a sword. The writer has a sword and it represents the blood that comes from these battles and these wars over, you know, power and authority and areas of control. Then you see two other horses come out, the first of which is a horse that comes out black. And this is, the rider has, you know, those like scales, like the scales of justice sort of. And on it, he has food and he's measuring things. And it's this idea of famine that comes. Almost like you always see on the heels of 
men who seek conquest and power, then you get war. And the next thing in the line is famine that comes. That the land itself is decimated in these efforts to conquer and to control. And then the fourth horse is this pale horse, which is the sickly green kind of color. And it represents the pestilence that follows, the disease and the damage to the land. And all of these are these repercussions that come from mankind being allowed to war. And I guess what I found myself, I found myself thinking over and over again, how hard it must have been for the Savior to open those seals. Because he's someone who created this beautiful planet. He created this world and all things that are in it. And he knows when he opens that seal, those horsemen come out. I mean, not literally, but like figuratively, war comes out and bloodshed comes out and men who hate each other and abuse each other. That It must have been so hard for him to open that seal. I found myself thinking, well, you know, I mean, in a very small way, have you had that experience where your kids finally get their license and you know you've got to give them the keys? But what's hard is, you know, as soon as you hand off those keys, if it's not this month or a year from now, at some point in the future, they're going to have an accident. You just know it, right? Like it's just bound to happen. They'll hit a mailbox. They'll hit another car. They'll Something is bound to go wrong and you almost don't want to give them the keys. But the only way they can become a driver at all and learn what they need to learn is for you to take that risk, right? And I feel like that's kind of the savior on this cosmic level. He's, he knows how this all has to go. And he's saying, the only way for me to allow men to progress the way I want them to, the way they're intended to, is to create a world where they have choices. What I love is, in addition to all these hard, devastating things that unfold, you also have this promise of guides and prophets. So if you flip the page... In verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Uh, This is a hard visual, right? These are martyrs for the faith. These are people who were killed in that onslaught of warfare and greed and struggle. But what's powerful to me is that means there were prophets all that time, when the Lord unleashed and allowed all that hard to come out, he also gave prophets. It reminds me a lot about what we know about the Garden of Eden, that when they were, you know, cast out and they had to go into this hard place where they would experience hard, he also blessed them with teachers and with tools and with understandings to keep them connected to him. They come packaged together, this idea of understanding things and growing in the gospel. They they always come together. So I actually find hope in that visual of these martyrs coming close together, having this fellowship and pleading for the time to rush so that the Savior can come again. I, I find hope in that visual. When you go a little further, you see the exchange that happens. I just think this is a powerful reminder of what happens when you give your life to God, this mortal life. Because all these martyrs offered themselves to the Lord. And what they get in exchange are these white robes. So if you look at 11, and white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was unto them as they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, they were, should be fulfilled. This fifth seal represents the time of John himself, right? So this is that, that time of the apostles who are trying to take the gospel out and are martyred in the process. They are even up until like, restoration times, I think you get a lot of this feel of those who give themselves for truth. And I love the exchange that's offered. Because I think when you live in a sin-sick world, like we do today, and like so many others have in the history of man, you get stained. You know, in this effort to teach and to help and to lift, you get stained in the process. And what he promises is, if you come to me, I exchange all of that. I give you these white robes. I give you a chance to rest for a season and to enter into my refuge. That's his promise. Then he talks about the sixth seal being open. So this is that last seal before the end of time, right? This is the time that we're in today to some extent. And it it stretches for a long, long period, but that's that's his promise. So there's going to be this time of apostasy and a time of restoration that will come. And all of that's sort of implied in the sixth seal. He also talks about things that will change in this time. 
it's kind of interesting. You can go into these and read them very literally about the sun being dark and it says the sun became black as sath cloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The stars fell from heaven. Islands move around. Mountains move. I don't know what all of those symbols mean specifically. But remember last week when we were talking about the stereogram, that magic eye puzzle that sometimes you have to like let your eyes settle for a second. <laughs> for me, what all of these verses together mean is things that have always been constant or agreed upon by society or understood now shift. You know, where for thousands of years, people sort of agreed on moral rules and things that help a society grow and get along, where most people agreed on things about like, you know, who you are and where you came from and all those things in this, in this final dispensation of time, they start to be more fluid. I just feel like that's our time, you guys. There's a great talk from Elder Lund where he said, he was talking about the youth and how they have to withstand these shifting moral tectonics of our time. And that's what I felt like I could see in chapter six. These moral tectonics of things that were always understood now are fluid. And what he promises is if you hold tight to his doctrine and his truth, you will be firmly planted. So that's what we learn in Helaman, that no matter what these crazy winds throw at us, if we are grounded in the gospel, we have, we have safe harbor. And what happens if you don't is what you see at the end of that chapter, where those who are kings and rulers and those who are used to hiding in the hills, and they become exposed in all this shift and they begin to fear. So you see that at the end of chapter six. One of the things I really liked about John's writing in these chapters is it almost feels like the tide going in and out as you read, because sometimes things get really intense and scary and hard, and then he gives you a break, and he, like, the tide goes out for a second, and you can catch your breath, and you learn hope-filled things, and then the tide comes back, and you learn more hard. Like, you're going to feel that push and pull throughout these chapters. Chapter seven is one of those areas where the tide is out and you have a chance to just soak in some sun. So enjoy chapter seven. Here are some things that I love. First off, he talks about the destroying angels that need to come. So they're almost on the brink of, you know, wiping out the wicked things of the, the world. You know how we have, we know that has to happen. That's what the wheat and tares parable is all about, that there will be a burning that occurs. But just like we learned about in the Book of Mormon with Jacob five, remember he talked about the olive trees and how the servant comes repeatedly and says like, let's just try one more thing. Let's just, let's try that. Let's move these trees here or let's graft things in. Like there is this constant, let's just try one more thing to warn. Remember, this is the savior constantly seeking to bring more under his wings, that refuge that comes in his gospel. He wants as many as possible to come. And that's what you're going to see in this chapter. Because basically what happens is he stops the destroying angels and says, another angel comes and says, we need to gather, we need to gather the elect first. The symbol that they use of those who are righteous is having a mark on their foreheads. I really don't think you have to take this literally. I think there's a lot of different ways to read it. For me, the most comfortable was this just means you're taking his name upon you. Now there's a lot of good, you know, if you go back into the Old Testament and you can read about having holiness to the Lord on the high priest, you know, hat that they wore in the tabernacle. There's a lot of cool references to this, but I really think this is very simple. It means, are you making covenants and keeping them? Are you staying tight and tied to the Lord? If you are, then you have him in your mind. You have him, your mind directs your actions. You have him with you all the time. So that's what he's alluding to. It's got cool Passover imagery. Because remember this happened in the Old Testament when the plagues had all come through and you get to that final plague that's going to kill all the firstborn and they have to mark their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. Like that's that same idea. He's saying we need to go and we need to mark so that those who are living righteously are have refuge. Remember that's what Zion is. It's a refuge. It's a place of gathering in strength. So that's what he promises. What I love is how that's accomplished. So if you look in verse three and four, for example, it says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then he lists out these representative groups from the different tribes. If you go into the Joseph Smith translation and some commentary from prophets, you can see that this verse is an allusion to the priesthood of God, that this Melchizedek priesthood offers these saving ordinances to any who will receive them. That's who goes out and helps. It's taking the promises of the priesthood to as many as will hear. And you see how many come in verse nine. So amidst all this devastation and the seals being opened and the struggle, there is this surge of gathering and the results in nine. 
After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with their white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. This is the work that we are a part of. This is that invitation to gather people to God from all nations and all peoples and offer them these promised blessings that come through covenants, through baptism, through the covenants you make in the temple. These promises are lasting. And I love knowing that in this grand vision of John, countless people come. It reminds me of, remember in Ezekiel 47 when we studied in the Old Testament and there's that visual of that river that comes from the temple doors. Remember we talked about how like anything that river touches turned green and it was lush and full and he goes out a thousand yards and measures and it's like to the ankles and then a thousand more yards and it's to the knees and like this river just consumes everything and turns everything lush and living and that's the feel I got. In fact, I drew that picture at the top of my margins in this chapter because I think that's his invitation is to be a part of this restoration of life and hope that comes by sharing the priesthood ordinances. So you see a lot of that in this chapter. I also love when John takes a minute to see each of these people individually. So he has a chat with one of the angels and tries to understand who these people are. And the phrasing of it to me was just beautiful. It starts in 13. And one of the elders answers saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest, <laughs> which I kind of love. This is John saying like, you're the angel. <laughs> Tell me who these people are. Tell me what you know. Similar to what you see with Nephi in the Book of Mormon when he doesn't know all the answers. And so he asked the angel to guide him through his vision. That's sort of what happens in 14. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. That's the end result of those who are gathered to God those who get to make covenants and keep them, those they get to endure tribulation in this earth life and wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. I think that's one of the things I liked about that phrasing is to me, it felt like faith and works. It was this combination of it's the grace of God that allows any of those clothes to become clean again, but it's my effort in that process and my desires and what I tried to accomplish that those two in tandem create white. They create this peace. I think we have to always remember that it's the Savior's grace that creates the power behind it, but I love the visual of both of those things working in harmony, even if they're wildly disproportionate. <laughs> um, it also has this sweet little ending of uh, the last two verses, speaking of the fact that they're going to live where the Lord is and have a place among, among close to the throne. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Part of the reason I love this is, I think sometimes we get an idea of the throne room of God and we picture just the very elect. You, know, I, you picture just the people that you think in scriptural history are like the best and the brightest, and although I'm sure they're there, the promise is that all of us who endured tribulation and repented and chose to partake of the atonement of Jesus Christ, we all get to be close. We all get to be where he is. We all get to be fed by him and led to living waters. And it's just a, such a contrast to those warring horsemen of chapter six. In fact, the, the ending sentence of God wiping away all tears, I just, there's some beautiful allusions to, in, to Joel in these verses, but he talks about this phase of things being restored, that there will be a time of comfort and things will be restored to you that were lost in this earth life. And I just thought it's such an intimate gesture. You know, I can't think of how many people I would allow to wipe tears off my face. There can't be many. And the very fact that this is how God interacts with us is just such a tender, poignant description of the kind of God he is. I just loved it. All right, chapter eight, now we shift to the seventh seal. So interestingly, the seventh seal starts with silence. There is this period of quiet. It gives the listing of a half an hour, but most things in Revelation are a bit fluid, whether they're literal or symbolic. So I think this is just kind of a proportionally short time. And it talks about trumpets that come. During this seventh seal phase, this last 
opportunity for repentance, there are these seven trumpets that come. And I loved, again, like I mentioned last week, I loved that book from Michael Wilcox on Revelation. And he related this seal and these trumpets that come to the story in Jericho. You remember when we studied that together, the, the idea of they circled around the city blowing these trumpets. In fact, even on the last day, they circled the city seven times. Like there are so many chances for people to hear and see and repent. Sadly, only Rahab and her family actually do help anyone and are saved. But you can see the Lord just continually inviting people to come. When I hear those trumpets and I, when I picture that story of Jericho, you can almost see a hen spreading out her wings saying, I come, come into this safe harbor, let go of all of this that's inside the walls and come out to where you can find peace and safety. And he does that seven days in a row. And then on the last day, he does it seven times in a row, almost as this is like pleading with the people to come out and to hear him. And that visual helped me understand these trumpets because each of them comes and sounds in the hopes that people will change course and come closer because time is running out. So you'll see some of that. First angel sounds his trumpet, and then a second one sounds his trumpet, and different things occur. By the time the third angel comes, we kind of see this great star fall. What's tricky about reading the book of Revelation is time is a little bit flexible. So sometimes you're going to be reading things almost in chronological order, and then you sort of all of a sudden jump in time back to pre-mortal life, or you'll jump to the council in heaven, or going forward to the second coming, and it's kind of hard to get your bearings. So this is a good place to go into the notes, or if you don't have the notes, go into the Institute manual and it will help you. But this is where you see Lucifer fall. What I think is really cool is the way they describe it as a great fall. So in verse 10, and the third angel sounded, meaning that trumpet goes out, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. This is an allusion to when Lucifer fell, right? He, he came from being an angel of light and he fell. And the visual of that fall, first, I think it's really powerful that he has this streak of light. You know, like any shooting star that you see, there is this vibrant streak of light that's eye-catching, and then it goes to nothing. There is no lasting power. Do you guys remember when we let that, lit the ping pong ball on fire, <laughs> and all that was left was just this, like, hollowed-out shell of fibers? It's that. It's that. There's this eye-catching burn, and then there is this blackness. In fact, what's powerful to me is what happens because of the fall of this star. So the same way if a star hit our planet right now, it would create this gigantic crater. Well, I don't know, maybe it would create something much worse than that. But that's kind of what, what the visual that John sees is he sees a hole in the earth that is bottomless. That's how he describes it. And then when you go into chapter nine, you see things start to emerge from that hole. So that star falling from heaven isn't just sad because the star falls. It's it's another one of those things that, because that seal has been opened, this next phase of devastation is allowed to emerge. And that's kind of the visual you want to have in your mind before you jump into chapter 9. It's interesting to me that all throughout those verses we just read in 8, only a fraction of the people are destroyed. It's almost like those trumpets in Jericho where they're, he's, he's almost like shooting a warning shot across the bow. It's not that everybody gets wiped out. It's like each one of these successive trumpets is trying to warn and encourage people to change. So only a portion of the people are destroyed. When you go into nine, you see this bottomless pit take its course. I just think what John is particularly great at is creating these um, contrasting images for us to stew over and learn from. You know, for example, we already learned about the Savior being these living waters that can bless and bring life to everything they touch. And here, especially in that last chapter, you see that wormwood, which is just this oily substance that poisons by degrees. Um, I think you see those two contrasting. In nine, you see the contrast to the Savior's offering of light and truth and things that come from heaven and touch the earth and bless it. The opposite of that is things that emerge from this pit. Um, and it's kind of a scary read. The tide is back in you guys. And in chapter nine, you're going to feel it. Because basically what happens is out of this pit emerges smoke. That's what comes first. So if you look in the middle of verse two, it says, there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. I think this is important because I don't think it's necessarily always that the Lord darkens things. You know, I don't think he 
changes the moon to blood necessarily, or that the sun is darkened because the Lord chose it that way. I, I, I don't know all the ramifications of this, but what the verses teach is that that happens because of this smoke that comes. There is so much confusion and fear and struggle and sin that people's vision is clouded. In fact, I think it's really interesting the order of things. So first you're going to see, come out of this pit, you're going to see this smoke arise. Then it's going to be this horde of locusts that devours everything in its path. And then last, you're going to see these horsemen, millions of horsemen that come up out of this river. And it's the progression of them that I thought was so interesting because it feels like the adversary to me. I think he always begins with a smoke. Uh, You see that many times in scripture. If you go in the notes, I lay out a bunch of these, but where he's, his goal at first is not to terrify you right? He doesn't, he wants to lull you into this carnal submission. So he's going to begin with smoke. He's going to begin by confusing you and maybe, you know, like making you struggle to understand and get your bearings. There's this smoke that comes. And then once he's got you discombobulated, that's when the next thing emerges. For me, this is like, if you struggle with the point of your testimony, or you're struggling to keep one of your covenants, he often will it comes because there is this smoke. You've got a misunderstanding about church history, or maybe you've misinterpreted doctrine somehow, or whatever the reasons are. The smoke is causing you to be a little bit off balance. When you're a little bit off balance and you don't find a way to steady yourself, that's when he can actually come at you. So in the next phase, you get for 10 verses or so, this description of this horde of locusts. Remember, we study locusts in the Old Testament. They they are this you know, creature that can come and devastate a landscape. In fact, we still see it in our day today. We, we read through this when we were talking about the plagues in Egypt, but they can come and just wipe out all the crops in an area. They get into every house, they get into every nook and cranny, and they just devour everything in their path. And I think that's Satan's strategy. If we don't get our bearings when we feel doubt or fear or struggle, by holding tight to our covenants, then he takes those opportunities and he tries to send things that will obliterate everything else you believe. I just have seen this. I think I've seen it with myself at times and people I love where he just sends in hordes. What's interesting is these locusts are not traditional bugs. These are locusts that have weird faces and hair like women. And like, it's this odd, this odd creature. And I guess I, there might be a lot of different ways to interpret these verses. For me, the like zoomed out view was Satan creates unnatural things that to intimidate and to scare. And they're not, when you feel that confusion, I think that's exactly what he wants for you. He wants you to be caught off guard and to be confused because he's a contrast to what the Savior offers, which is this simple, pure, beautiful truths, right? I think you see that into this third devastation that comes out, these millions of horsemen that come out riding across the earth, which I think is just the symbol of once Satan has a hold, once he's got his swarm of locusts out destroying testimonies and truth, he comes with this rampage of, you know, people who want to tumble over your testimony and knock everything in in their path down. What I love is that such a contrast to what the Savior brings. You know, he, he came with just one. He is just one, and he comes in humble circumstances, and he's born in a manger, and he's, it's such a vivid contrast to these millions of everything else. They, it just takes one uh, to combat all of this darkness. And I think, to me, that was the message of nine. I also think the warning at the very end of nine was a powerful one. So it says in 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. The reason I think devastation is allowed to come is because I think the Lord is constantly stretching his arm out saying like, come to me. I I need you to come closer. The same way when Elijah stopped the heavens, remember, and no rain fell in the hopes that people would turn and repent and come close to God. That's what the Lord is hoping for us. But what he finds is people still don't change. Their hearts don't turn. And a bunch are still remaining who worship other gods. And remember, this is John's language. And I think in our day, it's probably a little different. We have different things that we worship, you know, different comfortable gods that we've created with our own hands. And he's warning that you're going to hear these trumpets sound. You're going to hear these invitations to come close and you can't discount it. You have to set down the idols that we've created for ourselves and turn to the only source of truth.
Okay, we just struggled through that surf of storms and chaos in chapter 9, and now we get a break. The tide's going to go out in chapter 10, and we get a chance to see something mighty and glorious to kind of buoy us up. And that comes in the form of a mighty angel. So if you look in one, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. What I like about this visual, especially contrasting what we just read, not just that there's one person who comes compared to like the hordes of locusts and, you know, millions of horsemen. I also love how he comes. This mighty angel comes with bright, radiant light. And I, to me, this is kind of like the Lord's way of pushing out that darkness. Remember he said when light comes in, it chases the darkness. I think it's in the Doctrine and Covenants. And that's what I see happening here. The same way if you had a horde of locusts or whatever, and you put on this bright, hot light, they would scatter and scramble into these dark places. And that's what I picture happening in 10, that this one mighty angel who can straddle the sea and the earth um, scares off the darkness and brings a work forward. What's interesting to me is the focus isn't so much on this mighty angel. We learned from the Joseph Smith translation and from the Doctrine and Covenants that this is, in fact, Michael who is coming, and he has this mission for John to do. It's just fascinating to me that despite all this darkness and the millions of horses and all the stuff that John is seeing, this one mighty angel cuts through all of that to give John a job, a calling of sorts. That's kind of how I read verse or chapter 10, because basically he comes with seven thunders. That's how it's described. And thunder is just a way to communicate. It, it represents communication from God. So he comes with this perfect communication from God to tell John what his part of this mighty work is, that he's going to be a part of this gathering. And a big part of what he's going to need to do is to write this revelation and to seal things up. Um, I don't know entirely what this means. I studied a bunch of different theories on it. You can get some of it from like DNC 88, but this is an understanding that some things are not revealed just yet. Some things that John saw are not available to us. Some came through Joseph Smith and other, other prophets, but I think this is our understanding that this was John's calling from this angel to do this great work. What I like is what comes with this calling. So the visual that happens is this angel who, come, who comes and, you know, has one foot on land and one foot on the sea and is this mighty angel. He comes and has this little book in his hand. It's almost like a smaller version of what we read in chapter five. Remember when God the Father has a book in his right hand and the Savior takes it, that scroll that's sealed up, and he takes on that calling of sorts, and heaven rejoices. This is almost a, a mini version of that, because this angel has a book in his hand, and John is invited to take it, but John has to choose to take it. In fact, that's what you see in the verses. In 8, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, saying, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. This is John's choice to, yes, I will accept this calling and this work that you have for me to do. That's how I read it. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. This, I think, is kind of a sweet understanding about stewardships. I think every stewardship you have and I have, whether it be our family stewardships or our callings that we have through the church, they all require all of us. You know, when John has to take that book and consume it, it's like taking this calling and making it a part of him. It's, remember we did this in the Doctrine and Covenants when we made those pastry scrolls and we ate them? <laughs> that, that's what's happening here. It's, it's becoming a part of him. What the angel witnesses is it's going to be a mixed bag. There are parts of this calling that are going to be so delicious to you. And there are parts that are going to be bitter. And I think that's every stewardship I've ever had, you guys. <laughs> like, they all have both. That's how you progress and grow in it. In fact, John testifies to that. And he says, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. I, I think if you struggle with your calling or with your stewardship, whatever it is, just know you're in good company. They're both. They come with abundant gifts and blessings. And they also come with struggles and strains that will test you and try you and help you progress. And I love that you see that in chapter 10. I'm sure many times in the past you've heard about that sign of the last days that two prophets will be in Jerusalem and they'll teach in the streets and they'll be killed in the streets and left in the streets. And it's this horrific scene of a sign that will indicate that time is almost up. What I think is sad about that is we often focus so much on that piece that we miss the miracles that cushion that story. And they are phenomenal miracles. So read all of chapter 11, not just the middle. 
is basically what happens is he promises that he will send prophets and that they will come and they will do miraculous things for the people. So if you go on the verses, you can see in three, and I will give power unto two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That just means three and a half years. Usually that's a figurative term that means like a period of trial or struggle, kind of like the three and a half years of you know, famine time that Elijah caused. Same idea. So I don't think we have to take all this as exactly literal, but there will be two servants. In fact, I think it's Bruce R. McConkie that says these will certainly be members of the Quorum of the Twelve or members of the First Presidency. So that's who is here. And what he speaks of is their connection to truth. And it's in such a beautiful way. It's in four. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This is an allusion back to, I think it's in Zechariah 4. We talked about this in the Old Testament a little bit as well, but this is that visual that where there's these candlesticks, like a menorah kind of candlestick that is directly connected to these olive trees, meaning, meaning it has this constant stream of oil that allows it to beam out brightly. There is no, those, those wells that hold the oil at the top of those candlesticks, they never run dry because it's connected directly to the tree. I think that's such a beautiful illusion when you think about people like those 15 men who hold those apostolic keys. They are directly connected to the source of truth and light, and they will never burn out. That's the promise. And so you see him speaking about that in the verses. Then he says they'll have great power, like power like Elijah to seal up the heavens and to move mountains and to create miracles. I mean, for three and a half years or whatever that term symbolizes, a long period of time, they will be able to do great wonders and bless that portion of the world or maybe all the world from where they stand. That I think is a remarkable thing. It says that people will come up against them and they won't be able to stop them because they have a message to get out. I mean, it feels like Abinadi or even Joseph Smith, who no harm could really come to him in any lasting way until he had his message finished. You know, Abinadi could end up in shackles at King Noah's court. Joseph could be imprisoned or stuck in a basement in Liberty Jail, but his message would come forth. His days were known to the Lord. And that's what you get that feeling with these two witnesses as well. So in seven, it says, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And this is when you hear those prophecies about them lying in the streets and people celebrating their death. Uh, what's hard about that, and again, I don't know if this is literal or figurative, it's probably both. Um, I think this is the idea of truth looking like it's dead, hope looking like it's dead, peace looking like it's dead for a season. What is powerful to me about this visual is what comes next. That it says that they are restored. So the fact that people are rejoicing over their death doesn't last. In 11, it says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Unlike Abinadi or the savior himself, in this situation, everybody sees it. It's almost like a Lazarus type moment, you know, where everybody, whether they were believers or not, got to witness this incredible miracle moment where these two prophets stand. I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine the weight of the air in that space when you, when that happens, that is the cushion of miracles that I think we have to teach our kids about this prophecy. Yes, there will be dark days, but oh, they are cushioned with great miracles on this side and a phenomenal Christ-like kind of miracle on the other side. And that's what ushers in these last days. It's not just the bleakness of what happens in the middle. And that's kind of what you see at the end of those verses is that he's, the angels start to celebrate because this is kind of the beginning of that last phase, almost like they're anticipating victory. Remember, time is a little fluid in these verses, so it'll sound like the Savior has come and this begins like touching the Mount of Olives. But my understanding is this is kind of that phase where the angels are seeing seeing that countdown clock get smaller and smaller and knowing that the time for the Savior's coming is getting close and they rejoice in that proximity. Chapter 12 is one of those chapters that you get much richer understanding if you read it in the appendix. Because 
basically when Joseph Smith offered translations on these verses, in some cases he rearranged them a little bit. So it's it's a little easier to understand if you actually go back to the appendix and read the full chapter. But there's a lot of cool imagery in this chapter. Basically, he's talking about the time. If you look at the chapter heading, you can see that this chapter is focused in on the time of the great apostasy and the time of trying to bring truth into the world. What's powerful to me is the visual that he uses. So he describes a woman who radiates light, similar to the angel that we just read about in the previous chapter. She shines like the sun, and about her head are these 12 stars, and under her feet is this luminous bright moon. And she is expecting, and the baby that she is expecting represents Zion, essentially. So you can go in the Joseph Smith translation and see that this is kind of like the greater truth, the kingdom of God, and then the baby that she's about to deliver is like truth on the earth, this idea of Christ's church being formed and established. And you can go in the notes and learn a little bit more, but I kind of love the visual of it because you hear the opposition coming in really fast. If you look in three, there's this allusion to a red dragon. In fact, what it describes is that there is a red dragon that is following this woman and chasing after her in the hopes of devouring the baby as it's born, which just fits with Lucifer's plan, right? Like he just wants to shroud light in darkness. He wants to cover up truth. He wants to devour it and make it disappear. And he just can't. In fact, there's all these precautions put in place so that that can't happen fully. Even though the great apostasy seems to put everything in darkness for a time, there are these little flashes of light. And that's kind of what we see in the chapter, in the verses. So for example, it says in five, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron or an iron rod, the word of truth, as you read in the JST. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should feed her there, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So this is the understanding for me when I read this. This is like when you see portions of truth kind of tucked away. You know, you see things like the plates that get buried in order to emerge at the right time. They're in a place of preservation and a place that God prepared so that when the time was right, they could emerge kind of hidden from this great darkness that was sort of consuming things. You also see truths written into things like stained glass windows in medieval Europe that you can still see today or paintings of truth. You see these glimmers of light all over the place in history, even though there was a time of apostasy where most of truth was clouded or lost. There are these flashes of light. And I feel like that's what it means when this woman is in the wilderness and yet she is preserved and protected in all these different ways. So you'll see some of that. You also see how we overcome. Right in the middle of this chapter, right when things seem dark and you can feel this dragon creeping in and getting closer and closer to this woman, you get this flashback almost like you were watching a Netflix series and the, the story shifts all the way back. We go all the way back to pre-mortality and the war in heaven. It's like from verses 7 to 13 or so. What's fascinating to me is I think this is a bit of a pep talk. I think this is John trying to say, remember who you are. You've been in this spot before where it seemed like Satan was growing in power and that his arguments were getting persuasive and You've been in this spot. Remember how you voted last time. <laughs> remember how this went and how he fell. And remember that all of his people were cast out. We've been here before, so let's surge forward. I think that's why he has this little intermission of sorts that's tucked into the middle of chapter 12. It's a pre-mortal game plan that he's asking us to review so that we have confidence in the game of our day. What I think is really empowering in fact, there's a quote or, or a talk from Elder Hemulus that's in the notes where he uses these same verses and he says, basically, what John is doing here is he's trying to give us the strategies that we used primordially so that we can use them now. And you can find those in 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. This is the play that we used. You know, this is the incredible play that worked over the adversary last time that we can use this time that we take advantage of the atonement of Jesus Christ and we overcome through the blood of the lamb that we don't just have testimonies but we live them we keep our testimonies that's what gave us the power to overcome the adversary premortally it works for us today as well and then that last one they love not their lives unto the death meaning I consecrate my whole self in I'm not holding back I'm not worried I'm not fearful of the outcomes I am all in. And when we are all in like we were pre-mortally, we can channel that same power. That's his invitation. He's like, take the version you were then. I know you can't remember it well. In fact, Elder Hamula talks about how 
you should tap into those qualities are not gone. You just have to unearth them a little bit. You have to remember and find out the strength that you had primordially and use it today because Satan's strategies haven't changed. So the same tactics that helped us overcome him primordially can help us here. So you see a lot of that in those first few verses. You also see that Satan's getting worried because he's running out of time. So if you see in 12, he hath but a short time left. This to me is, you know, remember when he's chatting with Moses and he gets all blustery and mad because Moses won't worship him and you can see him getting kind of flustered. That's how I feel about the end of 12. You see him getting flustered and trying to chase down this woman and he can't, he can't get to her. In fact, his last remaining strategy is to seek after her children. So it says in 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. To me, this is what you see Satan do all the time. First, he tries to go after truth and confuse people about what is true. If that doesn't work, because it can't, truth always shines out in the end. Then he seeks after the children themselves, those who believe in that truth, and he tries to pull them down instead. And that's the warning that I think you find in chapter 12. We get another crazy cool beast coming out of the water in chapter 13. This has different parts, different components to it. They're all different kinds of predators. And you can learn in the chapter heading that these are just to represent the different degenerate kingdoms and this idea of vying for power and authority and, you know, pushing other people out of their way. It, it leans heavily on what we studied in Daniel. Those visions that we read about there, you see some of those same predators mentioned here. And I think the warning is just a simple one. It is whatever God you worship in this life becomes your demise in the next one. Meaning if you worship anything other than the true and living God, you end up being shackled. That's what we see in nine and 10. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. I think it's the same thing. I was in New York with my parents and we were watching a Christmas carol one night. And you know that Marley's ghost who comes in with all those shackles that are attached to these money boxes. I think that's what John is trying to tell us. He's saying, if you're seeking after the praise of the world, you'll end up losing yourself in it because the world's opinions and appetites change all the time, which means you have to change all the time. If you're seeking wealth or power, you're going to end up selling yourself in the process, selling your soul in the process in order to achieve it. And so he warns about that. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And then he talks about another illusion from Daniel about that image that when you choose to worship any other God, any of these false gods, they create images that you have to bow down to. Similar to what we saw with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What I love about that connection point is he, if you think back on that story that we studied in the Old Testament, when they refused to bow down and they refused to pray to that image of gold, they're thrown in a fire, right? There's this um, fear that's supposed to set in on them when that fire is ignited seven times its normal temperature. But what I remember most is the miracle that happens in those moments. I think when we choose to stand in a world that is commanding us to kneel before whatever gods they're creating for us, when we choose to stand, even if we're thrown into a fire, the promise is you are not alone. I actually love that about that story. Remember how, I think it's King Nebuchadnezzar who like looks into the furnace and he says, didn't we put three guys in there? It looks like there's four. You know, they are, not only do they come out without a hair of their head being singed and their clothes don't even smell like fire, they have someone with them the whole time and they are preserved. And that's, I think, the promise of worshiping the true God, that you will always have strength and protection and fellowship in this in this work. I think that's the message of 13. In mighty contrast to that great glistening statue and all the false gods they were commanding you to worship in the last chapter, you see the true and living God come straight through in verse 1 of chapter 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is you know, that last trumpet has sounded, the, the saints have circled Jericho for the last time and as many times as he possibly can, the Lord has called people to come under his wings. And now it is a time of, time is out. You know, it's almost like in all these chapters, you can visualize this hourglass with that sand just <laughs> slipping through where the Lord is continually inviting people just to come back and 
now time is out. And so this is where things shift in, in a beautiful, bright way, things shift. So he comes on Mount Zion and people sing. In fact, they sing a new song together. You can learn a little bit more about that in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's all in the notes. But this idea of those who are righteous know the song. They know the words of the song, they know the melody, and they can all sing together. Those who have his name written upon their foreheads. You know, they've made covenants and they've kept them and they seek that covenant connection with him. Those are who come. In fact, I love that you see so much about covenants in these verses. Like if you look in four and five, I actually felt like you could see most of the covenants we make in an endowment ceremony sort of woven into these verses. You can see it in the notes as well, but he's he's rewarding those who kept their covenants by saying, you come with me in this time. When that second coming comes and there is that you know, rising with the resurrection of the just, that, that's the promise, that you get to come in these moments and be a part of this magnificent occurrence that happens. He also talks about the everlasting gospel coming forth. So you see that in six. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountain of waters. Again, I, this is one of those times when I don't think chronology flows perfectly through the chapter. I think he's saying, this is what the restoration is like. In fact, Angel Moroni talks about these verses with Joseph Smith. That this is that time when truths are being restored and light is on the earth and it will not be pulled back again. That's this radiant time that we all get to be a part of if we are part of this covenant connection with the Lord. And then he warns about the opposite, that if you choose not to see, and if you choose not to engage, then you get to taste the wrath of God. And you see that in verse 10, that there's no rest night or day for those who choose this path. And then he counters it by teaching you about what happens to those who are, who do have his name written on their foreheads, that they have patience and they rest from their labors. I think that's what President Nelson's been teaching us, this idea of what rest really looks like. And it's not so much you sit still or that you sit on a puffy cloud in heaven. It's that you have this settled assurance that you're on the right team and this team will be victorious. You know, like there are, I think all of us, at least if you played sports growing up, you have those moments when you know solidly how this game will end. <laughs> Not that you've seen every play ahead of time, but you know, because you can feel the tide pulling you towards victory. Like, I don't know how to describe it. There were times when I could just feel it, that we knew our momentum was right. We were playing as a team. There was a harmony and we could not be stopped. And that's what I think he means when you find rest among the saints is you have that momentum and it, it will roll forward. You know, what topples that great statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is this stone that rolls forth without hands. Remember, that's what he's teaching us in these verses. And then he talks about the beginning of the harvest, that the first, they will bring in all the wheat and they will make sure that all that wheat is gathered in. And then the second harvest occurs and that's when the tares are gathered and things will be bundled and burned. And we'll get more of that as we jump into that in the following week. Welcome back, you guys. It's time for the creative side of week 50. So just like every week, my goal here is to give you three simple ways that you can take some of the things you learn from John's writing and apply them to everyday life. Ideally in weird, memorable ways so that your kids connect the excitement and the anticipation they feel with the scriptures themselves. I just think it's a powerful way to teach. So let me walk you through a, a few ideas to get the creative juices flowing, and then you can pick and choose your favorites or do something totally different. But let me walk you through the basics. Okay, first and foremost, I don't have anything to hold up for this one. Um, I wanted to reintroduce that idea of when you were studying the book of Revelation, and even to some degree, trying to understand our own revelation, we have to go through a bit of a process. There's a, there's a way that we can come to know things that are true. Sometimes with the book of Revelation, we have very clear answers. Like in Joseph Smith's writings in the Doctrine and Covenants, we have clear answers to what certain symbols mean. Other things, we're just guessing at. But I think there's some really powerful ways to help your kids figure out how to guess well, or how to get their own understanding about certain truths. And there's a process that you'll go through that is really similar to another process that your kids might be familiar with. So if your kids have ever used the Dingbats app, that's where you have those little word puzzles that say things like, they'll have the word weather and then have an arrow pointing down below it. And the phrase that it's trying to teach you is under the weather. But you sort of have to go through a process of 
decoding that in order to understand it. So for this object lesson, you're just gonna either find some of the ones I linked to in the notes online, or you can just download the Dingbats Between the Lines app and talk your kids through this process. We'll walk through it individually as well, but I think the process that you use to decode those cool little brain puzzles helps in Revelation as well. So we'll go through that. The second one is the more adventurous of the three because it involves a very sharp knife. So you need a big butcher knife like this. You also need a piece of fruit. We used an apple, pineapple maybe could work, anything sort of like that. And then you need a piece of paper. The reason we're gonna do this object lesson, it's a cutting object lesson that will teach your kids a very important principle behind what you read in the book of Revelation. And that is that those who are righteous don't need to fear the last days. That when you keep the covenants that you make with the Lord, when you diligently try to you know, stay in his refuge, you have protection in these last days and you don't need to be afraid. And the way you teach that is with this very cool apple chopping lesson. So I, I don't wanna, break. I don't want to teach you too much up front, but I think this is one that your kids will remember for a long time to come. So grab a blank piece of paper, an apple, and a really sharp knife, and you'll have everything you need. Okay, last but not least, I wanted to help my kids see the coming together of things. This week, you're going to learn about the seals, these seals being opened. There's seven seals that are opened, and by the seventh seal, that's when the Savior comes and restores things, and the millennium kicks off, and you have this moment of peace. But for most of what we studied this week, there's a lot of chaos and confusion and turmoil. <laughs> but what I think you always have to remember is that the reason John is teaching us this vision is because this is all part of God's plan. It was laid out before the world began, this understanding that Christ would be the victor and there would be a definite win at the end is part of God's plan from the get-go. And so I wanted my kids to see that. And a really cool way you can teach that is by creating snowflakes. So that process you go through of folding things up small and making weird cuts that seem like they might be devastating. And then that big open reveal of when it becomes something that has pattern and symmetry and beauty, that's what we're going to get across. But I didn't want to do just regular snowflakes. I thought it would be fun to make something bigger. So if you haven't made these before, we're making these gigantic snowflakes that are just made with regular pieces of copy paper. I give you a few different sizes in the printable and some with patterns on them like this. But the idea is really simple. It's that you, as you go through this process of creating this snowflake, you can walk through the, what happens in the book of Revelation this week. That even though chaos comes and war comes and devastation comes, it all leads to a point when there will be this peace and this pattern and symmetry that will indicate for us the hand of God. I think you'll see it abundantly clearly in the verses and hopefully the object lesson helps you see it as well. So this one, you just need copy paper and the printable and you'll be good to go. All right, gather those supplies and let's get started. All right, you guys, that is it for week 50. All right, I know it's a lot to study and it's a bit of an odd blend with all the Christmas tasks you're juggling. But I gotta tell you, I really think there's power in this combination. I was skeptical at first, but over the course of the week, I found myself buoyed up a little bit. I found my appreciation for the Christmas season and the gift that is our savior emboldened and empowered by studying the words of John. I think the contrast is so glaring. It is so vibrant. It like jumps off the page and it makes you appreciate his humble condescension even more. At least it did for me. So I hope it does for you as well. If you need extra help, you're welcome to join me on Instagram. I'm happy to chat through some of these insights and go into more detail on the object lessons. If you have questions or concerns about things, come find me there. So Instagram, 10 a.m. Monday, that's mountain time. I'll pop on and I'll do a quick live so we can walk through things. If that's not an option for you, you're welcome to watch it on my feed later, or you can just ask me questions on the discussion boards in the course or over on the YouTube questions or comments um, or on Gather. So if you haven't had a chance to log in over at gather.mechmom.com, that's where the course is going to shift next year for the Book of Mormon. And it's a great place to chat and ask questions and you know have, share your thoughts about what you're learning in these verses. My goal with this new site is to create a community feel where you can learn from each other, not just from the words that I'm saying. So I hope it's I hope you find that over on Gather. And the more of you that come and share your thoughts, the better that'll get. So come join us. But otherwise, enjoy this week of Revelation, you guys, and I'll see you next week when we get to dive headfirst into Christmas. Mm -hmm.